Hello everyone. My name is Paola Corti and I am the Open Education Community Manager at uh, Spark Europe. And I'm working with uh, the European Network of Open Education Librarians. Our efforts are all focused on uh, uh, doing our best to uh, act according, according to the UNESCO year recommendations. So we are trying our best to uh, help the larger global community to implement it. Uh, our librarians uh, worked uh, uh, along 2023 and 2024 on this series of workshops called Embrace the Open. And uh, our efforts so far has been quite successful, but we are happy to share more. So this session is meant to be very informal and uh, a large group of our facilitators from previous workshops is in the room today. So I will give the floor to them immediately. And in the shared Google Doc, you have all the links to all the recordings and all the Zenodo resources that we uploaded after each workshop. All the documents that we shared are openly shared in, with a CC BY license and in an editable format. You are strongly encouraged not only to watch the recordings, but also to reuse and adapt everything that we shared so far to your local needs or to some groups of specific uh, uh, stakeholders that you are working with in order to advocate with them for open education, but also to support uh, uh, collaborative upskilling activities. In our case, in our experience, this workshop series has been a great opportunity for our librarians to um, uh, deepen their knowledge about specific topics, but also to start working across the borders, across the boundaries of their own institution with the other librarians, members of this network of the NOL. And uh, sometimes it was for their first time. Uh, it was their first experience collaborating with someone abroad. Sometimes it, they were more experienced with it. In any case, it was interesting for all of us to be there and see how um, open they were to uh, peer feedback and to do their best to support upskilling their peers. Uh, so let me give the floor now to our facilitators and I will pass the, the baton on to Marta uh, because you are first in my screen and then you are free to to pass your baton to any other facilitator. Please tell us who you are, where you come from, and which kind of workshops you've been working on so that people in the room can relate to you with their questions. Okay, so I'm Marta Bustillo. I uh, am a digital learning librarian at University College Dublin. And I have been a member of the ENOIL since I think 2021. Um, and it's been an incredible, incredibly enriching experience to work with colleagues from across Europe. Um, and the workshops that I participated in were uh, workshop, workshop number four, which was the first workshop of 2024, OE Librarianship 101, um, which was basically a, a whistle-stop tour of the various things that uh, open education librarians should bear in mind and understand that they can be involved with. Um, then I also did workshop number seven, um, sharing OER, and workshop number eight, how to start an in institutional OE pilot project. Um, I have to say, I am a newbie on all of this. Uh, I'm trying my best to make everything I create as a digital learning librarian as open as possible. But one of the things that I wanted to do with these workshops is to say, uh, it's never going to be perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good enough. And you just have to try your best and start there and you'll get there eventually. Thanks a lot, Marta. Who is going to go next? I have Mira on my screen after Marta. That's all right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. 
Um, my name is Mira Baljuk. I work in the Netherlands at the University of Groningen, and I am an open education librarian or information specialist working at the library uh, on all things related to open education. So educational resources, but also practices. And I've been a member of uh, the NOL for the past three years, I think, two years since 2022. Um, enjoying this community and working with them very, very much, immensely a lot. And I was happy to participate or to co-host several of the uh, workshops here, the first three on open textbooks. So we talked about the concept of open textbooks, um, also about uh, organizing a pilot on open textbooks, and we looked into the publishing kitchen uh, behind the open textbook publishing, together with several other colleagues, and Lambert is also here, so he'll tell you more from his side. And I was also uh, one of the co-presenters at the last workshop um, about starting an institutional OE pilot project. Uh, quite interesting, I think all of this also new to me in many ways, some things we can share from our side, but even more I learn from uh, all of my wonderful colleagues here and the audience and questions and reflections shared with us. Uh, so I look at it as not only paying forward or you know sharing our experience, but even more as a learning opportunity for myself and development opportunity uh, for myself and, and other colleagues I would share this with um, in the future. So I would like to pass uh, the baton to, uh, let's go with Claudia. Thank you, Miro. Uh, yeah, my name is Claudia Hacke. Uh, I'm from Austria and um, I'm at uh, working at the University uh, of Vienna, uh, where I um, am responsible for OER at the institution and of the institutional anchoring, for example, OER policy and all our services. And uh, I'm also responsible for the national OER project, Open Education Austria, which is um, conducted in the higher education sector of Austria. And all universities and higher education institutions um, are, are more and more taking part of it. And uh, we're establishing, for example, a, a meta search engine for all the OERs uh, located in the different institutional repositories. So that's my my point of view. And I loved uh, starting um, in this group uh, in summer and working together uh, with Marta and Mira on the workshop on the institutional um, OER pilot project, where we talked about the national perspectives of Marta with Ireland, Mira with the Netherlands and me with Austria. So uh, we had this national perspective on OER and what this means for starting and having first steps on how to tackle the OER uh, topic at your institution. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass um, the word on to Lambert since we're kind of neighbors with Austria and Germany. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Lambert Heller calling from Germany, uh, as Claudia already mentioned, from TIB, Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology. And as Mira already mentioned, we ran together the first three parts of the Embrace the Open series which happened last year, all of them, um, which were about open textbook projects. And since this is, uh, we are really early on with libraries, uh, even larger research libraries or national libraries running open textbooks project. So it's really early stages and I'm always happy to uh, continue the conversation and um, benefit from, from the session here. And so I pass the baton to Peter. Well, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Peter Velerutnes from from uh, University of Tromsø, uh, the Arctic University of Norway. I've been a member of NOL for, I guess, a little over a year, or maybe a year. And um, I contributed to the uh, seventh workshop, which was called uh, Sharing OER. I talked a bit about the, the, the problems with sharing OER and also something a little bit about accessibility. So that's what I was working with um, mostly last year, uh, no, before the summer. Now I'm working with people who are, who are actually sharing and um, are positive to OERs. Yeah, all right, I'll pass, pass it to um, Catherine. Thanks, Peter. 
Catherine Briggs here from the Atlantic Technological University in Ireland. Um, we have no open educational resources librarian. I'm the systems librarian and information literacy specialist. Um, hoping, you know, looking forward to having an open education um, resources librarian in the future. And we just uh, hope, wait and see. Um, I co-hosted um, the workshop Embrace the Open, Find an OER um, with Evie from Greece, who's not on the call. Um, and we went through, you know, how could you find the OER online and identify relevant repositories and other sources um, using search strategies and, you know, getting help from the community. So it's a great community here and um, we're always looking for new members. If you have the time to um, meet up with colleagues from around Europe, there's great work going on. So I hope you enjoy this workshop. Thanks. I'll pass the baton on to um, Susanna. Thank you. Hello, I am Zuzana Stojicka from Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information. I work as a open science support because we don't have anybody specifically for open educational resources, but I'm trying to promote them in our academic community. I joined NOL uh, this year or at the end of the last year when I was in a conference and found out about the existence of NOL. Then I joined and translated uh, NOL tools to Slovak language. And I was facilitating a workshop number six about reusing and creating open educational resources because that's what we are mostly doing, introducing open educational resources and uh, trying to teach our academic community uh, that it's a normal thing and how to do it, how to use Creative Commons licenses, because in, in Slovakia, some organizations share their uh, outputs, but they are not used to uh, the Creative Commons licenses. Oh. Thanks a lot, Susanna. Um, Thank you. It was very interesting for me to interact with Susanna because she is uh, uh, one of the best members we have, I think. She started joining by joining the NOL and immediately jumped into more than one working group very actively and taking the responsibility also of facilitating the workshop by herself, which is not very... Uh, I mean, she's been brave. I'm very happy about what we did together. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have now uh, gone through all our facilitators in the room. Now it's your turn as participants. I mean, if you have any question ready for them, if you have anything that you want to ask, uh, please go ahead, open your microphone if you prefer, or you can write the question in the chat or even better directly into the document that I share. Uh, as an example, I see that uh, Michelle is writing an answer now. So uh, we can uh, start yeah, it, looking into that. Uh, Michelle, it might be faster. Also, yeah. It might be faster to just say it. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> and right. um, I, I still feel, even though I might be over a year, per, you know, meeting this group, that I'm still on the edge, and that's okay. That's fine. I'm happy to be on the edge. Like Catherine said, we don't have an open collections librarian post. But I'm the head of learning and engagement. And part of my job is the, the oversight of the collections for teaching. And um, I do want to explore an open textbook service, e-textbooks, open textbooks. Um, the best we've been able to do this year is to switch on the packages of open books in our Primo interface. So it's not an enormous bit of progress, but it's a step. And uh, so it, it stay, it's still on my agenda to, to do this piece of work, however we do it. What I'm curious about is, has anybody seen or read or written up the steps involved in moving your university from zero to somewhere uh, or, you know, big progress? So I'd be interested in studies about that or the experiences of people or even, you know, maybe an Erasmus week or something like that, that allows everybody to, to get together and discuss it. So more, more questions than answers. Um, and hopefully in another year, I'll be able to contribute some answers. First of all, it's wonderful to have questions because it's through questions that we can collaborate better and explore. 
what's out there. Uh, let me ask this directly to our facilitators then. Most of all, those involved in, uh, uh, in the open textbooks, uh, uh, um, uh, workshops maybe as a starter. But also I think about uh, Marta and the uh, Open Education Librarianship 101 when you take the first steps in order to, to start. Just go ahead, I mean, very informally as we said. <laughs> Michelle, just a question. So are you thinking in terms of what librarians can do or in terms of how you move the, the, the whole policy to the university? Because I think they're two distinct things. All um, of this. Okay, all, so... All of this is my problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was asking. Um, so the... The Open Education Librarianship 101 workshop was basically covering the different roles that librarians could play in supporting open education. So it was from something easy, like what you said about opening your uh, open packages in, in your Primo interface, to um, advising about uh, licensing, to learning about how to make the resources that you create as open as possible. Um, but actually, what I was fascinated about was when um, our final work workshop with Claudia, because Claudia has the, the sort of the national and the institutional policy overview. And I think the resources that you shared, Claudia, were really interesting. So I'm, I'm passing the baton on to you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Marta. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know if I can share. I don't know. I cannot share the screen, but it, it doesn't matter. Uh, maybe Michelle. I'm allowing you. I'm allowing you. In okay. A because I, I just looked for the one slide with all the stakeholders involving into one of these things. Thank you, Paula. So I'll, I just share this one slide here. Um, you have the uh, Zenodo link uh, in the chat, uh, Michelle, um, uh, for all the stakeholders that you can, should, maybe want involved uh, when starting a OER project or, or OER movements, maybe. Um, so um, depending on where you are, because you said you're teaching and learning. So are you at the university library with the department of the learning? aspect okay yeah uh, so it always depends on the institution for example with a uh, university of austria uh, university of vienna in austria we are at the um, uh, e-learning center so i work at the e-learning center and we work together with the library they host um, a repository for example together with the it services and uh, we conduct um, the workshops for uh, for teaching faculty but also for the students uh, student support staff, and we're in contact with the management together with the library and the IT services. So maybe that's um, one of the first steps to check out what other colleagues you can take on board. Maybe there is already a, um, a scientific repository that you can reuse or also use for OER, for example, which is what we're doing at the University of Vienna. We, we only have one repository for all of the uh, data and publications and, and OER. Um, so that's that. Um, and uh, maybe to follow, I would like to uh, pass on uh, to um, Mira, because you had a wonderful um, image and slide on how to get an, uh, get an overview on where your institution is at. And maybe that's also something helpful for you, Michelle. So I will uh, maybe, I don't know, Mira, should I, should I? Yes, please, yeah. If you could you go to 68, to... yeah, because uh, probably maybe I can't. I'll... I'll just click there. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I was actually looking for this resource as soon as you asked, and I, I have it printed out always with me. Uh, now I need to look for the link to send it and uh, share with Michelle, and all of you will do that in a second. Um, so it's been documented in different ways, uh, maybe not per se as a blog post. And I remember there was a publication by uh, one of the Dutch institutions, surf related institutions um, a few years ago, describing sort of the past towards open uh, textbook publishing and 
first pilots. Uh, but besides that, we documented it in uh, this series of uh, webinars, this series of workshops. So if you're precisely looking into um, a narrower topic of uh, starting it's uh, something related to open textbooks, then I would refer you to the first three uh, webinars, uh, namely the second one uh, where we didn't have a lot of slides, but we talked a lot um, with Lambert and I about how to set it up, how it actually happened at our universities. But also, um, I'm sure you want to know broader about OER in uh, in general, and I would also like to refer you to this um, more, um, yeah, uh, more detailed infographic. You only see snippets of it here on the screen. Um, this was also developed by uh, by SURF, Dutch collaboration of um, uh, the, the, the universities and the universities of applied sciences working in the digitalization sphere um, and the, they also consulted with all of us with uh, many of uh, open education related librarians OER related librarians to come up with a sort of um, guideline or um, checklist to see at which level you are and what is possible at this level and what is even more necessary at this level. So first you go uh, with a pilot, most likely exploring it through the pilot. Uh, then, oh, thanks a lot indeed. There's the <laughs> very handy link indeed. Somebody will now share it in the chat, thank you. Uh, first you look at the pilot and uh, there are also very handy um, points, pointers to whom you should speak, what stakeholders you should involve. Then when you are more established as a service, you look at how you develop it, whom you still need to involve, what aspects you need to remember and keep in mind. And then you go on to the, the bright future of actually maximizing OER, but we're not there yet, still working on this timeline. So I would really like to recommend this resource. It's quite visual um, and maybe it helps you and gives you some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, indeed, uh, please check out the previous webinars and um, especially the last one, number eight, that uh, Claudia was referring to, where we also talk about this uh, institutional pathways towards establishing something of the open at different levels too, but also mentioning national contexts, because it, it is unfair to only talk about what you could do at your institutional level without mentioning what is actually enabling you or uh, maybe standing in your way at the national level, because for instance, in the Netherlands, we're a bit luckier to have uh, quite a well-developed national infrastructure and a lot of support coming from the national level and uh, quite developed communities um, of uh, experts uh, talking to each other and exchanging experience. In other countries, um, that's less so, less fortunate, uh, yet still a lot is happening. Uh, so I would like to refer you to this. And okay. um, if you're interested in the angle of open textbooks, I think uh, Lambert would also have a lot to say uh, on this topic of how you start that up. Mm -hmm. I think if I take one word away from what you said, and that's very helpful, I think the idea of piloting something is actually the right way to start for us to go. For sure. Here, for sure. Here's the reasons why. And let's try this on a small scale and then. For and sure. Piloting. It... Yeah. And finding pioneers that are willing to do that with you. Usually you can easily find them among very active teachers. Yeah. OK. OK. Brilliant. Thank you. Let me just add a, a comment to that. First of all, we have one of our members, uh, Tatiana Kolesnikova from uh, Uzust University in Dnipro, who always uh, uh, talks about uh, the small steps tactics. And this is uh, helpful for us as a way to go in many different uh, uh, ways. Also finding champions uh, at the local level can be very helpful, but in, together with planning a, um, a step-by-step -step process of implementing or at least starting to add some resource that is op openly shared. It can be also very useful to keep on one side some advocacy tools that uh, can help you very quickly to identify the benefits for different stakeholders. Uh, we have another tool that we just uh, updated uh, in the English version and we are going through the process of updating the the, um, uh, the, the all the language versions that we usually have, that is the annual toolkit. We just published, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, the fourth version. And uh, in, in it, you find uh, very, uh, very relevant evidence-based benefits of open education for different stakeholders. So playing with the different tools can be helpful because uh, depending on the table you are sitting at, uh, having also some benefits and the, that speak to your decision makers can be effective. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, has anyone anything that they want to add? Or maybe I would like to add that good opportunity is, uh, for example, International Open Education Week. Is the opportunity to show to faculties that uh, open education is used all around the world and they can see the resources which can be handy for them. Wonderful, thank you, Susanna. And I will add the link to the Open Education Week in a moment. Okay, do we have another question or anyone wants to add to what we already shared about this first one? Otherwise, I have one myself. <laughs> because I'm curious to know if any of our facilitators on top of our other members had benefited from this experience in terms of uh, having some, uh, the experience in itself, but also some tools that you started using to prepare uh, your workshops. Uh, um, that you wanted and uh, succeeded in adapting to other needs at your institutional level, being them for open purposes, but also for other upskilling purposes too. It's even better because we consider open in the broadest sense of the term. So, Paula, I should say I have definitely benefited from this. And one of the things that I really like about collaborating with colleagues across Europe for these workshops is that we really need to plan and plan in advance. We can't just do it, you know, last minute by the seat of your pants kind of thing. So because of that, Paola, who is brilliant, has shared resources that we use to plan the workshops. Specifically, there is um, a spreadsheet that we use to design our presentations where we consider what content we want to include, in what order, what kind of interaction with uh, the audience we want. And it that has been invaluable to me as a teaching librarian because it, it's a tool that helps me think about how I am structuring my own presentations as a teaching librarian for my institution. And it's, it's actually made me think, okay, this is not just about broadcasting, presenting information. It's also about how we want this information to be absorbed, what kind of interaction we want with the audience. So it's been really, really helpful. Paula, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just noticed. I was typing and I didn't want to make noises. No, I just said that uh, in the in in the links that you find in the shared document, uh, together with the slides and the resources that our facilitator used during their workshops, they also shared the the workshop plan, which comes with this Google sheet that Marta mentioned, and uh, they all adapted it to their needs for this series, but we are using it also in many other ways uh, for other annual activities. And I'm happy to know if uh, you are using it also at your local level. My, uh, the sense of my question was that uh, sometimes reusable resources come in different ways. So when you look at them, don't on, please take a look at them with uh, the the, the most open approach you can adopt because uh, uh, you might find in them something that is useful for other activities that you plan to do and uh, um, that might benefit from this experience in ways that you don't even expect starting from the title. So that's something that I learned myself by doing and by reusing resources designed by others. So it's uh, one of the benefits of... Uh, the greatest benefits of open educational resources, I would say. Uh, and thank you, Michelle, for correcting the way that I reported your question, because I prefer you to correct it. Thank you for, for doing that in the document. Anyone else who has a question, or also one of the facilitators is willing to ask questions to, to your peers. But first, our 
participants today. Do you have any questions? Or also something practical that you are facing today on, in this period in your library or in your institution and that you might want uh, to ask in this small group of people, ask for advice or for other experiences. Paola, I may share something here. Um, one of the things that has been also very useful for me from the eNOEL uh, network is that I'm creating digital literacy resources, online resources, and it's great to get feedback from outside my institution. So it's been an opportunity to promote the resources and get comments about them and maybe help other people um, strategize about how to share their own resources. So that has also been a really useful thing. And I'm thinking, uh, I, I have had recent questions from um, ENOIL members about the resources that, that I am creating. So it's it gives you a, a sense of, okay, this is what I'm creating for my own institution, but it's having an impact outside the institution, which is great. And also you're getting kind of suggestions and ideas about how to share them better. And yeah, I might just add there quickly. I think a lot of people still have the idea oh, if it's open and it's free, it can't be that good. So I think for us, it's trying to get that across, you know, especially to, you know, the newer generation of students, the younger ones that, you know, this open stuff, you know, a lot of it has been evaluated. There's loads of rubrics and checklists that, you know, that we can give to our students, to our researchers, to our colleagues, you know, to say, well, you know, this stuff is really good and it's just about finding stuff that's relevant to you and to your courses and your students. And it's great that we have this group to, you know, ask for help, as Martha said, if we're doing stuff, you know, we're in our institutions and we have a way of doing stuff. So with this group, you kind of think differently as well when you're doing stuff, which is great. Yeah, thanks. Please, Burku, go ahead. I, I just would like to thank you all. Uh, I am Burcu from Istanbul Technical University, and I am working at IT, ITU Mustafa Inan uh, Library. Uh, I am one of the uh, advocates of open science, and I am trying to for a long time, but uh, we are still at the very beginning of open access publishing and this stuff. But the issue is that we are really expecting to get our uh, academic support with uh, this OER thing because it is not something necessary for the future, but must thing. So I just would like to hear what's going on. This is why uh, you are seeing me nearly at the end of uh, one of your um, closed uh, workshops. I just would like to know you one by one. Maybe I think in the future when I have a chance to open a conversation through our uh, administrative units, maybe I can invite one of you to share your experiences and the way you come today. And I believe that saying some uh, something from the teacher is not enough and uh, you would like to put a first step. I need experiences that really shared by other institutions and the feedbacks and the problems that you face. So I'm just listening, but I really uh, feel very happy to be here. I am lucky to catch, catch up with you. I am listening. If I have any questions, I will ask it to you, but I just want to uh, say my appreciations. Thank you so much. So, thanks a lot. Uh, because it's interesting also to to have this opportunity to open a window for people who yeah. are new and uh, sometimes not new uh, to the topic, but new to the community 
or that uh, might not have a specific question to ask now, but we will be here. We are available. You, you can write us an email and you can join the network because it comes for free and uh, there is no uh, activity that you have immediately to mm -hmm. be uh, participating to if you don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable. The idea is to have this community who is helpful uh, at the peer level, first of all, mm -hmm. and then for the larger community. So whatever we do in our communities, CC BY, and mm -hmm. uh, all our meetings are open to mm -hmm. all the people that are willing to be members, which mm -hmm. comes for free. Uh, there is uh -huh. no fee and nothing more official than an email to me, and I will add you. <laughs> so just join us if you want to. And then whenever you feel ready, or if you have mm -hmm. questions, or if you need help, you ask for this help. Otherwise, you can join some of the activities that are closer to what you want to progress on mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe have some benefits from this community. I mean, that's actually what we do. <laughs> this is what I am expecting. The issue is that it is not enough to know something about this kind of initiatives, but also it's important to be part of, but I am not sure that if I can be one of the uh, most motivated one, one, but I will try and I will send an email to be part of the community, just catching up uh, everything that you shared. Um, thank you so much. No, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. That's why we're here. <laughs> and I see some comments in the chat now from uh, uh, Maura. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing this resource, Maura. It's very interesting to see that, yes, uh, there is a lot of work ongoing to uh, create audio versions of the textbooks in order to make them more uh, uh, inclusive. Uh, some of this has been going on also for, in Creative Commons, for example. I don't know if you know that uh, there is a certificate for uh, uh, educators and for librarians that focuses on uh, uh, Creative Commons licenses. It, it's not free, but uh, there are, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, opportunities to, to join with the reduced fees uh, in case needed. But they also share all the, the educational materials of this certificate with the CC license. And uh, what, um, the English version was also recorded by Jonathan Poritz, I think in 2023, as audio files, which are shared on the, um, on the Creative Commons website. I will look at uh, the link because it's also useful for us as a community to sometimes refocus on the basics of uh, the resources that are out there and that we can uh, be inspired by or that we can reuse ourselves. So that's that's something that I'm going to look into immediately now and share in the chat. Any question now about, uh, uh, about any topic from our participants? You want to ask anything to our facilitators? while I look for this resource. While you do that, um, maybe it would be useful to share um, the kinds of questions that we can help with. Um, there's a message there from Irma, and she reached out to me because she got my name from Monique Schautzen, who is a member of our net network. And it's one very typical example of the, the kinds of problems that we come up against when we're creating open educational resources and she was saying well we're hoping to create these resources we're probably going to be using articulate as the tool to create the online tutorials do you have any experience of sharing these and so i was able to say well this is why i say that i am as open as i can be <laughs> but only so far sometimes and I, I was able to point to the ways in which I have tried to share my articulate tutorials, which are, because they are proprietary, it's sometimes very difficult to um, share them with people who don't have a license for articulate, but you can still make the, the files available and people can download them. 
Um, and so I was able to say to Irma, look at, at uh, our digital literacy website. This is how we are sharing and hoping to share even more in the future. But it's, they are facing that situation now in their institution. I've been grappling with it for the past uh, couple of years. And just sharing that tiny little bit, bit of information of, of saying, look, maybe you can't share the editable version of Articulate, but you can still share the files. That's one thing that you can do. Um, Thank but you, I agree. I agree with Borshu that sometimes nothing can replace the actual experience of somebody working in the field. Um, no matter how much access to resources you have, it helps to talk to people. <laughs> I totally agree with that. And thank you, Marta, for pointing the discussion to the resources that you can share in the format that you are allowed to work on as a first step. Because uh, uh, one of our focuses in this community is design for users, okay? So that's one of our biggest efforts. What we try to do in, within the NOL is to do our best to start from formats that can anyone can open with the open source uh, software or can at least download in a copy that can be then opened and edited with the open source softwares. So this is something that it is in our power to do as far as we can. And that's what we are trying to do. But uh, whenever a resource is available, even in a closed format, of course, it is not as easy as with editable formats uh, to change it. But uh, it's a first step. And sometimes it's not in our control to decide which software our institution decides to adopt or how far we are allowed to install other uh, open uh, softwares in general on our computers. So this is a very common situation. So as far as possible, it's, of course, it's better to start designing uh, in editable formats by default, but if not, and without proprietary formats also. But if not possible, uh, the next best option for sure is to, to have them shared with an open license. That's what we can do. So thank you for pointing to this because uh, according to the approach that we adopted, as far as open education is not the default, we have to continue sharing in the formats that are available in our institutions and uh, in our daily activities. Uh, it's much better than nothing. And uh, it's uh, very encouraging also, I think, for those who feel somehow powerless in taking uh, uh, action with something that is uh, more open by default. I'd like to add to that. Uh, that's something that I probably learned the most or took out of our sessions. Besides the practical materials and the great examples I could incorporate into our um, well, teaching materials on OER, with which we train our teachers, this uh, op intangible open approach of keeping reusability by default, by design, uh, whenever you start talking about open or making something open, uh, and not just for ourselves, but also for the teachers we are consulting, for the future open textbook authors, uh, those who also working with students uh, on open pedagogical projects. So that's been a big um, lesson learned for me to keep it always in my, yeah, kind of the most basic, the most default conversation with them to already in early stages start orienting towards um, reusability of whatever they are creating, even though sometimes it, is, it does happen in proprietary software. It's not always open software. We try to use open source software. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes we need to uh, use YouTube as our only hosting platform. There's no way around it at the moment, but you know we're looking into it. But we're always uh, asking our teachers, uh, creators of OER, uh, to keep that in mind or to allow us to share uh, the original video file via other sources with the appropriate open license, um, or to make it as editable as possible besides having it on another platform, this or other platform. So I think this kind of um, intangible open approach principle has been one of the most useful parts for me to always uh, 
yeah, not only uh, do myself in what I'm doing, but also uh, teach others in how they should be doing it. Thanks a lot, Mira. <laughs> Any question from our audience? Is there anything that uh, you are focusing on at the present time that uh, is challenging, challenging you, very practically speaking, and that we you might want to to share uh, with us and to look for, you know, further experiences or uh, some consultation <laughs> from peers. Meanwhile, I will share one thought, uh, starting from what Mira just uh, said. Uh, we also, as you see, use uh, some proprietary uh, platforms, including YouTube to share our recordings and uh, uh, Google Drive uh, um, tools. Um, it's, it's been a, a big discussion uh, a while ago, and sometimes we go back to it because, of course, uh, uh, those tools are not radically open. But uh, it is very consistent with the approach that we continue, so far at least, to agree upon as a network. That is, let's be as inclusive as possible at first, and uh, let's let's try to be welcoming to people that might not have specific skills in using uh, uh, open software tools, but are more used to do to use in a daily on a daily basis uh, more common tools. Okay, we are not focusing on uh, uh, building uh, specific skills in using open software uh, uh, on princi in principle. We are uh, um, focused on developing an open approach to sharing uh, resources. So, uh, of course, it will be a good idea in the future to upskill and use as many open software tools as available, but we want first to involve the people and have them work with us without the need or any barrier in feel welcome with the skills they have. And then we can build on skills together. So that's the purpose. Petar, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead and open your microphone. Hi. Um, I had a question um, about, uh, ironically, my own presentation during the workshop seven, uh, but a question to you. Um, I mean, the participants and the facilitators. There's. Um, I was talking about the um, challenges to sharing OER, and essentially they are centered around the incentives not being there, uh, so that uh, it's not worth it uh, to sort of face the challenges of finding a, a suitable platform and um, learning about licenses and everything involved, unless you get something out of it, except, of course, idealism. Those who are idealists about it are already sharing, so those people aren't uh, the main tar the target demographic. But um, there is an initiative in, in Norway uh, to... Um, which is based on the Dura statement, I think, roughly, um, which is um, to change the career assessment of scholars um, to include open practices. Uh, so this is a specific um, initiative from all the universities in Norway then to, to create a new uh, ma matrix for, for assessing careers. Um, so that's for tenure and for uh, hirings and stuff. Uh, and it includes open education as one of, uh, I think one of five uh, main main points. So that, that's a hopeful thing to sort of uh, answer that, the main issue, the main problem in a way. It's of course, uh, it's just in name. So it doesn't mean that the practices will, will sort of conform to it uh, immediately. At least on paper and it, and in terms of policy, it is in place. I was wondering if uh, how it's what it's like in the other countries, uh, in your countries, if there is something like that, or if it's already solved. Yeah, that's my question. So I can speak uh, about my country. We have nothing like this. 
uh, open education is not officially in the picture for the, the training or the job description of our um, professors or teachers more broadly. Uh, we have some, uh, let's say, um, references in the official documents from the government that uh, speak to, to open education as, uh, um, let's say, an, an invitation to share educational resources with an open license. But it's not mandatory at all, and it's not considered from the upskilling perspective, which is needed because uh, either you let teachers know how to deal with licenses, otherwise quite difficult for them to embrace the movement. So that's the situation so far. Uh, hopefully it will change. We are trying to take action at the national level in many ways. I will keep you posted when something changes on this side. I know that something is happening in Austria. <laughs> So I would love, and also at your local level, Claudia. So <laughs> maybe you want to share something about that. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking for the uh, links to share them as well. Maybe another colleague wants to go next and then I can have it all ready for you. <laughs> I can go next, yeah. I can share a bit. Um, so to answer um, your question better, it's not been solved <laughs> uh, anywhere, I think. Um, not nearly there, but also in the Netherlands, um, in the Dutch context, there are some movements towards that. Um, more on the side of open science, that's way more discussed, how to integrate uh, open science practices into uh, some form of rewards and recognitions uh, for uh, scientists, for academics who are in many cases, both researchers and teachers. And it's also different for different uh, types of universities we have in this country. Uh, so we have the classical universities, but also universities of applied sciences, for instance. So it's um, like our focuses would be a bit different, um, but it's there. People are talking about it and uh, the need for r, &R is recognized. Um, and not just for the OER related r, &R but also for any type of teaching as a career related uh, rewards and recognitions, because still, at least in the university context, you're being more uh, rewarded for doing research, for doing good quality research, for publishing, you know, the publish or perish paradigm and so on. Um, yet there is also a movement of how to uh, establish this educational career tracks. And here lies a great opportunity for open education and OER. Um, so what we're trying to do, at least at the university level, is to see if we can uh, pilot with uh, one or two faculties that are more teaching oriented um, to, to pilot it, to see how OER and open practices can actually be used for assessment, uh, but also not to try to step into the same issues that uh, our predecessors had with using metrics only, for instance, for evaluating and not evaluating other important things, uh, maybe uh, public engagement or leadership or doing uh, you know, all the other wonderful, awesome things that go along with the academic career, not only the metrics that are connected to your publishing uh, or impact um, numbers. Uh, so we're looking, we actually applied uh, for national funding. It was an open science related funding again, but uh, within our proposal, we developed two um, yeah, lines of reasoning. One was for uh, experimenting with open science related. I think it was uh, open fair data related uh, kind of uh, assessment uh, for yeah, assessing and uh, recognizing uh, good, um, good practices among the researchers. Um, that was one track. And another track was actually open education because we also have uh, such uh, faculties that are called university colleges that are uh, teaching focused, education focused first and research comes um, a bit uh, second. So with one of them, uh, they were enthusiastic and willing to see how open education and OER can help them uh, with reforming their own R&R approaches. That will happen next year. I have nothing yet to, to tell uh, as, as for results or anything like that, but I hope to be able to share um, in the future. But there, there are some movements and we're just looking for opportunities to jump uh, on or to, to grab, um, especially uh, combined with the general challenge of rewarding teaching and educational excellence, uh, finally starting to reward that at least equally, um, yeah, so as the research excellence is being rewarded. So we're trying to look into, into those pathways. And I will step in with this uh, rewarding um, point that Mira mentioned. 
now I found the correct link. Um, in the Open Science Policy Austria, so we have a national open science policy. There is this OER aspect uh, written in. Um, so this is deeply connected. Uh, as Mira also said, it's coming from this open science point of view. And this is also something that, yeah, proved in Austria, for example, to be really helpful to work together in this open under this open science umbrella term uh, with open data, open education and everything. And um, the second link, which is probably more uh, interesting for you with, with this rewarding um, part, we have a OER certification in Austria. It's to certify an institution, for example, as an OER university or OER higher education institution. Then you can also certify yourself as an OER practitioner. And you can certify your qualification offers um, also there. So these three parts. And I, I just had a look um, at the numbers. I think uh, it's about 200 uh, lecturers now have certified themselves as, as an OER practitioner. Um, it's not a lot. Universities does, that have already their um, open education qualification measures uh, certified because that's what you need. So first step, you would need your um, qualification offer, uh, certify that, and then you can um, certify your, um, your your lectures. Um, we at the University of Vienna, we handed in our um, uh, application to certify the qualification measures and the services uh, a few weeks ago, and we're just uh, waiting for the uh, commission to approve it. Um, fingers crossed, but I think it should work out. And then we can start as well, because we, we have our OER qualification. We just not have the certification yet. And then we can do that as well. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think one ECTS is the uh, overall number of uh, workload. So it's 25 hours workload and they can they get, they get their certification at the end and can add them, add it to the CV and everything. And since, since this is funded by the Ministry of Education in Austria, it's uh, something important in the higher education sector because it has, has direct funding there. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the mini mini info what is happening here. And unfortunately, the English website not has quite as much info. So maybe you can just jump to the German one and ask Google Translate or so uh, in, in Chrome to translate it, because then you can also see what you have to have as an um, OER um, certified higher education institution, which would be the OER policy, the qualification offer, and a certain amount of number of certified uh, lectures, yeah. Thank you, Claudia. I have a very practical question about uh, what you shared so far, because I'm very interested in uh, in uh, how fast is this project uh, process mm -hmm. and yeah. how, uh, how bureaucratic is it? Because this is something that can get in the way of everything when it comes to certifications and to making progress and most of all in convincing people to be willing to embark in this uh, in this process right um yeah so um this is uh, something that we um developed uh in this open education austria project um so we started with this overall project with the first beta tests and everything in 2016 to 2018 that was the first um round of this project and from 2020 to uh, this year, at the end of this year, we have the second version of the project. So the follow-up, uh, Open Education Austria Advanced. And in this period, so from 2020 on, starting right in the lockdown phase and everything, uh, we uh, developed uh, this certification body. Um, so in the first round, there were only ideas and a white paper, for example, that was published. Um, but uh, from 2020, um, we had, um, I think we had one year of development and then another year and a half of the first um, universities to take part in this and um, to yeah have like a, a first round, a test round. But now this is up and running. It is, um, uh, they have the commission there. Uh, I think it's... Um, four people uh, from uh, Germany, Austria, and um, Switzerland, they, um, they uh, view the applications. They're OER experts from different fields. 
um, from the education part, library part, and all the stakeholders I mentioned. And they review the applications uh, twice a year. And yeah, and then accept them or say maybe minor revisions or anything like that. And it's one uh, person uh, working there at the OER certification, which man um, and the colleague manages the, the e emails, for example, questions, organizes the meetings of this um, um, of these experts. So it's um, yeah, now it's a rather easy, um, uh, easy process, easy process, but it was intense because we had a whole work package with lots of colleagues working on it um, to develop this system. So just so you know, I already invited Claudia to share more about this experience <laughs> and her experience <laughs> at the, the Vienna University. And in the future, we are going to share more, more details because, and thank you for, for that. I think that uh, your experience, Claudia, in, in Austria and the context you are working on, together with what is happening in the Netherlands mainly, but also in Germany in different ways, and maybe Lambert can tell us more, uh, are very encouraging for countries that are far away from that yet, including mine, uh, because we know at least, uh, at least we as active uh, uh, advocates for open education, we know that we are not going to start from scratch. There will be a moment when our institutions will be somehow ready to start or just be willing to catch up with other countries. I don't care. <laughs> what I want to see is that at a certain point, we go practical into making some changes. And then we as advocate for open and practitioners can help them through your examples and your previous uh, experiences, because we don't need to start from scratch. We are in the perfect context where people are willing to share what they went through in order to enable us to move faster forward. We are good enough at uh, filling our uh, desks with paperwork and the bureaucracy by ourselves. <laughs> so it's uh, useful that someone can uh, help us uh, go faster. Lambert, do you want maybe to add something that relates to the German perspective? Yes, I'm happy to do so. So Thank yeah, you. yeah. F f first of all, I, I agree with with your assessment, Paola. I, I, from my perspective, Austria and Netherlands are ahead of the crowd, uh, including Germany. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but but uh, so so I, I really I'm a believer in the strategy of uh, picking good partners to um, come up with a pilot project. This is really the key thing here because you can you can talk and it's important to talk about open education, but um, then again, uh, to take action and, and to show results and good products, good uh, uh, educational resources, this is decisive really. You cannot stress this enough. That's super important. And to be smart about looking around your um, local environment, or your um, or the area research associations around you, universities, whatever, and to be smart about picking partners and building good pilots. I, I'm I'm really a believer in the strategy. And uh, sometimes it turns out that it's not only about. I mean, one one good thing about open educational resources resources are they are freely available to all, and that's really important. No question about that. But one one thing that, uh, from my experience, um, is often important from the other perspective is um, when you find uh, young, ambitious teachers who uh, are ready to become your partner and your pilot, whatever this is, an open textbook or whatever, then uh, it's often their perspective that they are more free in the way they, um, the, the composition of the open textbook, for instance. So, so uh, traditional publishers normally are somehow constraining in, in, in this way, right? So I came across, uh, this is one of the largest open textbook projects in Germany that I know about. It's, it's from um, the field of uh, pedagogy and they um, um, have this approach that they built a huge, uh, very comprehensive handbook on, on certain areas of education. And they include uh, a really professional uh, video interviews with those who wrote the chapters. And this is, uh, I mean, 
on a technical basis, you could do this with a non-open textbook as well today, right? But it doesn't happen. Yeah? It turns out that open textbooks are often places where they are that are more welcoming for experimentation and new formats and things like that. This is the reason, or this is one of the primary reasons they were successful in um, adding contributors to their huge uh, handbook project. And uh, this is something to keep in mind. So be smart about uh, who to look for, uh, for your pilot project. And also uh, there might be different reasons why, why it is interesting for them to join you. Not only that the product is freely available, but also <clears throat> this uh, level of um, technical independence or, or being uh, more um, free to, to experiment with the format and so on. I'd like to add to that. Uh, thanks, Lambert, for mentioning indeed this uh, pioneers and uh, intrinsically driven educators that we all tend to work with, or at least to start working with at the beginning. And uh, as you said, many of them are value driven and come from the right place. They already are convinced that this is the right thing to do, the right way to go about it. You don't even need to work on that. But I also like to look at it from the R&R perspective, as in what else can we give them besides help with publishing, consulting them, making life easier, but what else? What could be good for their career? Maybe uh, publishing this OER will not be career changing at the systemic level, but it does give them more visibility. Um, per se, by having their name out there, not only as a researcher publishing an article, but also as an educator sharing their educational excellence. That's the first one. And second, uh, they can use these OER um, outputs that are almost always externally facing, right? You not only use them in your own teaching career, but you also would want to share with the rest of the world. So many of them tend to use them. Uh, to submit them as um, items for other kind of professional awards or teacher of the year kind of award and a thing happen, happening. And we've seen that happening with our own teachers. And it's wonderful, not only because they are sharing it as an OER practice, as a best practice, but because we know that can benefit them. And that puts them on, on the, yeah, that puts them out there and their name out there as one of the active teachers, maybe somebody else will consider for a project, an interesting project starting or oh, who in our faculty do we know that does this and that, then their name will pop up. So this kind of visibility uh, does not only need, doesn't, on, doesn't need to only come from this official r and uh, reward and recognition structures, but can also come from the actual practice. And we can enable that practice, right? At the university level, but also nationally. So I always tell our authors that, hey, I'm using your example when talking to my NOL colleagues, or uh, we're going to present at OE Global, and I'm gonna show your example, uh, by the way, <laughs> just so you know that your practice will be internationally discussed. And you can also apply, by the way, as a teacher, as a practitioner. So uh, using at least like, this is the least we can do, I think, um, and already something, something else than just leaving it as it is saying, oh, our system doesn't work for rewarding and rec recognizing talented educators uh, or OER practitioners. Uh, we can also do something. Thanks a lot, Mira, for adding to that. And thank you, Lambert, for sharing also the link to the open textbook you were mentioning. Uh, to add to that uh, and focusing on practitioners once again, I think that uh, multimedia uh, open textbooks, uh, if we co continue to call them textbooks, uh, even if now maybe this term is somehow, you know, uh, old or not uh, comprehensive of all the resources that are shared, are also an opportunity to give visibility to those who are uh, contributing quite largely to the creation of uh, uh, compelling educational resources, but are too often only working behind the scenes. And the, work, the recognition part is very important. So uh, it is uh, more and more um, clear, at least in my uh, daily practice, that uh, uh, giving uh, the floor directly uh, to the people that are often working uh, behind the scenes with skills that sometimes teachers can rely on but don't share themselves is the best way to get them involved in the movement. So it's wonderful and to, to have them involved officially with uh, uh, an opportunity to be seen for their work so that others can learn from them um, easily. 
So in a way, it is important to allow ourselves, as Marcia, Marta mentioned at the beginning, to go with good enough instead of looking for perfection and try to share resources in multiple formats using different media, even if not, let's say, in the best shape that ideally we would like them to be shared. But at the same time, when we have uh, expertise in the field that is very relevant for us, having them involved and recognized officially is uh, extremely relevant to move forward, I think. So thank you, Mira, for what you said. I see that I need to catch up with the chat. Uh, because there are additional resources that are shared. I'm trying to copy and paste all of them at the end of the document so that the shared document so that we have them all after the end of the workshop in, a, let's say, um, um, a, a list. It's not a very well organized way, but maybe we can add some notes there in the future. Um, and please check if I copied and pasted everything or if you need to add more. Any question from our participants in the room or any question from our facilitators to their peers? Because I have a curiosity otherwise, because I never asked you as a group of facilitators if uh, uh, the, the efforts that you put into designing and facilitating this workshop series helped you being recognized in your own library or at your own institution. And please be very straightforward about it if you want, because I mean, uh, it can happen, it cannot happen, uh, but uh, it would be good, great to know. Paola, for me, it's actually part of my remit uh, in my role. So, it is recognized in the sense that I let my boss know everything that I'm doing, but it's, I suppose, just part of the role, which is, you know, uh, even the fact that it is part of the role is an interesting thing because I think it's quite new to have a librarianship position that includes an open education remit. Yes. Now, the, I mean, in my case, it's an open education remit on top of a lot of other things, but at least it's mentioned, Yes. which I think is good. That's wonderful. Yes. Hmm. I think for me, it's also part of the role as I see it. And nobody ever says, no, don't do it. Of course not. Um, but it's not something that's expected. And in a way, it's good and bad. It's bad because, yeah, too bad. <laughs> You're not expecting us to be more active and more involved like this by default, which I would expect uh, of people working in this sphere. Um, and it's good because you can always pos like position it or use it as a an extra activity, your extra initiative you're taking during your... Um, what do you call it in English? I don't know. Uh, results and development interviews, for instance, right? You can also showcase your uh, leadership or initiative or whatever values you are or whatever um, characteristics you are being assessed on, right? So I also use it in, in that uh, context uh, along with some other things that are happening. Um, and I guess it always is perceived as something extra, but I don't mind uh, that it's perceived like that. Maybe it does serve a, a good purpose in that case then. Yeah, but it's a good suggestion anyway to track what you do uh, and uh, consider it uh, one of the activities that you do as a librarian and maybe uh, it might not be today, it can be tomorrow, but uh, you might find something in it for you professionally speaking, I mean, in order to be recognized. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because... Uh, uh, um, you have an official role connected to open education, which is really uncommon still uh, compared to what happens, for example, uh, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, where in North America, at least, uh, and in Canada too, open educational resources librarians are officially recognized and uh, as such. And they have a job description that is completely 
related to that. We are still far from there. Uh, I, I'm not expecting this to change very quickly, but I'm happy to see that some changes that include open educational resources as part of a, an official job description uh, here and there is happening. So I'm very happy about that. I think yeah. it's quite a norm in the Netherlands as well. And I think, Irma, you also have uh, OER librarian only a standard position. If I'm uh, correct, really? me if I'm wrong, please. Well, that's wonderful. So a complete job description that uh, in, in includes well, actually, only activities related to open educational resources. Actually, I put it on my um, uh, and, and, and my email. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not really official, but it's the work that I do. Exactly, it's so reflecting the reality, right? I work as an open, yeah. It's an I, I work as an uh, I say advisor, open uh, digital learning and materials, and um, that's what's in my uh, description. But officially, I am that's not an English word for it. Functional beheerder. I work mm -hmm. in a digital uh, digital library uh, with us. And this is uh, the subject that I uh, have in my in my work. Mm -hmm. So I work for uh, um, the Holland University of Applied Sciences. I work as an expert for Ampels uh, Digital um, Open. My English, <clears throat> I have to switch. Um, so I work there as an as an expert for one day uh, a week, and I'm also um, into the um, we call it Bibliotheque Open Online um, Education, the BOOO. It's familiar to this group, but only for for the Netherlands. We also um, have. Um, uh, how do I say, uh, 10 or maybe 10 uh, workshops uh, online. And then I want to share them with you. Much of the, it is in our own language. So I feel now here, how can I share things that are mostly in our own language? Of course, uh, he can help us to translate, but still I don't want to share the uh, Dutch uh, links uh, with you. So that was kind of my struggle in, in informing you with our activities. But thank you for introducing me, uh, Myra. And I was looking how can um, this, this uh, community um, connect to Bay OOO and how can we learn from each other? So that's one of the uh, things that I, I tried to find out. Actually, yeah. I might give you a pointer here, an idea, because one of the first workshops we did in this series, together with Sylvia Moose yeah. uh, and Lambert and myself, um, that was the workshop adapted from the BOOO workshop originally. That was in Dutch, fully oriented to the Dutch audience. We just adapted it because, as Paula said, we were looking for something already in existence, the low-hanging fruit we could start with. And that was based on, of course, we changed things, we added the German perspective uh, from Lambert, uh, but that was actually the work, uh, the original work we we did, um, okay. I think, two years ago or something for the BOOO workshop. So okay. you can easily like localize and, and change and vice versa. You can now use the, the workshops here to use as a, as a topic or as a whole workshop at the BOOO, not to have to reinvent the wheel and start from, from zero, from scratch. Yeah, true. Well, that's a good, uh, uh, yeah, good suggestion. And uh, I didn't know that, that it was... Uh, they yeah. translated into English. And yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, we took it as a basis and translated yeah. a lot of things. Like Sylvia, I think, used actually all the same things uh, because, you know, she was talking about this mm -hmm. toxicology a textbook. Lots of things are just transferable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And know, examples exactly. remain the same. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are now um, having an, uh, a workshop on CC license, also on the, the international training. One of our... Uh, our information specialist uh, did this uh, training and she's telling uh, about it. And we found many uh, people in the Netherlands who, who are interesting to, to uh, 
join the, the workshop. So we're very pleased to uh, experience uh, this. And she also made some materials in English. I know she did. I don't know if she wants to do this in, in English, but I know her English is good enough because the training is also in, uh, in English. And um, so, yeah, uh, I, I take this to, uh, to Brenda. She's the, um, what do you call this? Chairman? The chair, yeah. I'm the deputy chairman now, and uh, I, I'm going to, dis to discuss this with her, and I hope we can uh, connect and uh, help each other with um, the, the activities that we do. And uh, when we do the same things, we don't have to invent them uh, ourselves uh, again. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Irma, for sharing that. And also it's interesting because English for us is really uh, a tool that uh, helps us uh, to, to talk to each other, but we are very, very interested in uh, continuing to have uh, resources in local languages. That's what we try to do also with our major outputs because otherwise uh, all the people that don't use English as a second language are excluded and that's not what we want. Also. We are really interested in uh, supporting languages to survive what is changing with uh, all new words being invented only in one language mainly, because uh, that's not what uh, will help our uh, different cultures to continue develop together with the language and continue following up with what are the new needs. So I'm happy to know that you are developing uh, the resources in your own language first, and then okay. considering <laughs> English. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we still have uh, uh, time for one last question, if uh, anyone has one. Otherwise, I will simply wrap up and uh, thank you all, first of all, uh, all of you facilitators and all of you as participants to this uh, workshop, because it's been a very interesting informal discussion uh, with questions and answers from all corners of Europe. So thank you very much. And I'm also pleased to see that uh, once again, all levels of development of open education at the local or national level are welcome. And uh, we are happy to share suggestions and tips uh, from all corners. And uh, um, this, uh, this context where we work in and that uh, makes everyone feel comfortable with ever, whichever level of development they are at the present time is uh, really something that uh, we can count on to move forward in order to make open the default one day soon in our countries, hopefully. So that's me uh, closing with uh, my usual motivational <laughs> thoughts, very positively approaching the future. Uh, we are going to have, hopefully, a new workshop experience uh, soon. We don't have a date yet because we were waiting for a, a good opportunity uh, to set it within a, a broader context. But uh, the next step for us would be to share more about the process of designing this workshop series and how we approach the, the, the topics together, prioritizing sometimes low-hanging fruits, as uh, uh, Lambert and Mira said before, um, uh, but also focusing on uh, providing support to upskill our peers as far as possible and taking the opportunity to upskill ourselves in the middle of the process. So we are happy to share that, that, to, that too, so keep... Uh, 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 keep your head uh, up uh, as soon as we share in social media or by email everything that we can uh, organize next time. Thank you all for uh, your participation and I think that uh, uh, we are done for the day. Thanks again. Thank you for hosting us, Paula. Thank you for being here as usual. Bye.